this is um, this is billed as uh, the founding fathers in the age of Trump. So I thought I'd start off with not the 45th president, but the first president, and and just say a few things about him. Um, how many people here have been to high school? <laughs> I've not even graduated, but just attended attended high school. Okay. You've, you've all had more education than George Washington had. Uh, he may have gone to a small uh, local school. There's a reference in someone's correspondence to his school teacher. There's, an, uh, there's another reference to a tutor uh, that his father seems to have hired. Uh, if his father had lived, he might well have been sent to England for middle school education. That's what happened to his two elder half-brothers, but his father died when he was 11, so that didn't happen to him. Uh, he's one of the least educated presidents we ever had. Only maybe Lincoln and Andrew Johnson had less education than he did. So the way he made up for it was lifelong reading. Uh, he collected pamphlets on all the political issues of his day, uh, beginning with the uh, 1760s all the way up through the start of the revolution. Uh, he knew often the authors who were writing these documents. One of his neighbors was George Mason who wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights which is the model for both the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. Uh, they would hunt foxes together because their plantations were only a few miles apart. Uh, he knew Alexander Hamilton because Hamilton was on his staff during the Revolutionary War. He knew Thomas Jefferson from the Virginia House of Burgesses. Uh, James Madison he met during the war. Uh, Madison attached himself to Washington. And by the mid-1780s, Madison was spending so much time at Mount Vernon that he was getting his mail delivered to Mount Vernon rather than his own plantation. So Washington knew the intellectuals of his day. He read their work. He drew upon them. Uh, Madison ghosted his first inaugural address. Hamilton ghosted his farewell address. Uh, Jefferson may have ghosted his address to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, which says that this government gives to bigotry no sanction. Uh, but Washington uh, edited these works that were ghosted for him. He didn't simply passively read them. And I'll just, just give you one story about his reading. During the Constitutional Convention, uh, he attended a party at Dr. Franklin's house, and the Spanish ambassador was there. And Franklin and, and the Spanish diplomat were talking about a new translation into English, newish translation of Don Quixote, which Washington had never read. So the next day, Washington went to a bookstore in Philadelphia and ordered that translation. And his thinking was, Spain is an important country. Uh, we're going to have dealings with them uh, for the foreseeable future. This seems to be their big book. I have to understand this. I have to read this. This is a very Washingtonian um, thought. Uh, second point about him is his temper. Now, he had a temper, but he had such good control over it that we've forgotten that he had one. That's not our image of him. We, we, we think of the face on the dollar bill in the quarter in Mount Rushmore, and that doesn't look like the face of a man with a temper, but he had one. And so how he dealt with it all his life was by keeping a lid on it as best as he could. Uh, in one battle he showed it, this was the Battle of Monmouth in 1778, and one of his generals uh, was given the responsibility of making the attack, and he seems to have bungled it. And so Washington appeared on the field. He had to take command himself. And he chewed this general out, a man named Charles Lee. Uh, and another general named, named Scott said, uh, he swore on that day like an angel from heaven. I have never heard such beautiful swearing in my life. So now, about the trees fell from the, uh, the leaves fell from the trees. Leaves fell, yes, yeah. leaves fell from the trees. Now the only problem with it is that Scott was two miles away when this encounter <laughs> happened, so he never heard it, but he'd heard what people had heard about it, so he's embroidering this later in life, and, and clearly Lee was very taken aback by, by, by this explosion from Washington. But apart from that, nothing in public. There, there's one account of a cabinet meeting by Jefferson, uh, because Jefferson would take notes of what happened. He'd, he'd go home at night and, and write down notes of cabinet meetings. 
This was a sort of Nixonian streak that Jefferson had. And uh, this was at a period of, uh, uh, of tension in our relationships with revolutionary France. And uh, so the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, had brought a newspaper to the cabinet meeting, which had a cartoon of Washington being led to the guillotine. And the guillotine, of course, is the French instrument of execution. So this was both an insult and it was making a political uh, point. And uh, so Knox puts this on the table, and then Washington, Jefferson writes Washington's reaction. He says, yes, I saw, I saw this newspaper. Uh, I'm given three copies of this newspaper every day, as if they expect me to be a distributor of their newspaper. I have only regretted holding this job once since I took it, and that has been every day since. I would rather be on my farm. I would rather be emperor of the world and what I love about this is this is how people, this is how we lose our tempers, right? You know, it starts and then we think, yes, this is good, this feels good, let me go with this, I've been holding it back too long. So uh, there's a pause, Jefferson says, and then what happens is they resume their discussions. And as far as France goes, they decide to kick the can down the road. They're not going to have a confrontation. They're, they're going to just see what happens. So Washington had that flash, but then he bottled it back up, and he did not let it affect his decision. And that's, to me, an impressive example of control over his temper. And then the, the, the last thing is control over his words. Uh, Washington got burned when he was young. He, he um, fired the first shots in the French and Indian War. And he wrote a letter to a relative of his, at, this is his first battle, and he says, I've heard the bullets whistle, and there's something charming in the sound. Now this letter got published in America and also in England, and it was read by the king at the time, George II, who was the last English king to lead troops in battle. And George II said he wouldn't be so charmed if he'd heard many. Uh, so this was embarrassing uh, to, to this young officer. And over the years, he learned discretion. And this was especially important when he's president. Because by then, he's the most famous man in America. He's one of the most famous men in the world. He's the first president. No one knows how this is going to work. They hang on every word he's going to say for hints. Maybe they can make investments off it. They can make predictions. What most politicians do in this situation is small talk. You know, you talk about nothing. Uh, Lincoln was the master of this. Lincoln had a thousand stories. Uh, one of his cronies, uh, Leonard Sweat, described Lincoln receiving people after his first election, and they want jobs, you know, patronage. And Sweat said he heard them all, he told them all a story, and he sent them all away. You know, and that's, that's how you get rid of people. That's how you keep people at a distance. But Washington didn't have that ability. He had no small talk. So what he would do is this. I can keep this up for a long time. He could keep it up for much longer. And there are accounts of his you know, dinners he throws president, and people are like they're bored to death. You know, the president, he's not saying anything, and one senator notices he's like playing with a fork on the edge of the table, you know, bouncing it. And, and the senator doesn't understand that this is deliberate. You know, if, if you don't have something you must say, you must not say anything. That's the position he's in. And since he can't tell stories, he'll just keep his mouth shut. So he has control over his words. And, you know, this is such a valuable technique that every president since has mastered it. So, Joe, um, what can you tell us? Uh, Richard and I agreed that he would get to talk about Washington and I would try to do something with equivalent uh, brevity with regard to the whole group of people we call the founders. Obviously, I have a much more difficult task here. Um, uh, there are a couple of misconceptions that are rooted in our thinking about the founders that need to be eliminated right away. When I'm on what Gore Vidal in his wonderful way used to call the book chat trail, um, 
I would get questions like, what would George Washington think about Iraq? What would Benjamin Franklin say about the Affordable Care Act? And the answer is Washington doesn't have the vaguest idea where Iraq is and that Franklin wouldn't give a damn because he's on Medicare. <laughs> Um, but the deeper answer is, these people are busy being dead. They don't come to talk to us. Don't expect that. You can go back and try to understand them, and there is a body of scholarly work and of documentary evidence that's in fact unparalleled namely the largest collection of documentary evidence about a political elite in recorded history. But you got to go do it. So that the work is ours if we wish to seek their wisdom. Do they have wisdom? Well, I taught in leadership studies at Williams for a year and um, I remember saying to the woman then head of leadership studies, I want to let you know before I start that I don't believe there is such a thing as leadership studies. And she said, that's okay, none of us do either. <laughs> um, I believe that um, one of the Supreme Court justices um, said it well, it was his name, not Colin. Um, I'll come up with it. It was in a case on pornography. Potter Stewart, Potter Stewart. you know what I'm going to say, yeah. Potter Stewart said, um, we, don't, we can't define pornography, but we all know it when we see it. <laughs> That's also true of leadership. If you wish to define leadership in some theoretical way, it's going to be very difficult, but believe it or not, the best place to look for American leadership is with James McGregor Burns' works, um, which were written here at Williams College, and are the standard against which everybody else measures that kind of writing. Um, if you wish to say, as I do, that leadership is something that must be studied in action, place to look in American history is the late 18th century. Emerson said they saw God face to face. We can only see him second hand. Now that's nonsense. They didn't see God. They were making it up as they went along. They were all imperfect creatures. And we need to get rid of that assumption. And serious historians continue to use words like miracle to discuss the founders, like flames of tongues of fire appeared over their heads at Philadelphia in 1787. It's time to get over. Unless you believe in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, it's time to get over that. It's really tough, though, and I'll tell you a story to try to make the point. I was on the book tour for a, the book I wrote on Jefferson called American Sphinx, and it was a book that's it's not an attack on Jefferson, but it's a critical assessment of Jefferson, I would say. And it was actually written before the DNA evidence came out on the Sellingham's connection. But I gave my talk, and this woman got up in the Q&A. This was in Richmond. By the way, there are places in Richmond that are further south than Birmingham. And um, Richmond's a really interesting city, and the southern accents there are really deep. And I'm from Virginia. Um, this woman, she was a woman of a certain age that was sartorially splendid. And I won't be able to duplicate her accent perfectly, but she said, Mr. Ellis, everything you said is wrong. And I know it's wrong because Mr. Jefferson appeared in my bedroom last night. 
and he told me he was, you were going to say these bad things about him. And Mr. Ellis, you are a mere pigeon on the great statue of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Pretty good. And so I didn't know what to say. I was like, you know, next question. And, um, but she came up in the Q and, in the, to get her book signed. And she gave me her card. It had her name on it. It said Poet. She later sent me a poem, but it was really, anyway. But by that time, I had recovered my senses or my whatever. And so I said, Madam, it's not important whether or not you regard me as a pigeon. It is extremely important that you recognize that Thomas Jefferson was not a statue. <laughs> now, that's what I'm, you know, all new nations require mythical heroes. Romulus and Ramus, King Arthur, El Cid. What's distinctive about the United States is they're all real people. They're not fictional characters. So we make them into fictional characters. They cannot bear that. They will not they will not be able to, if you're serious, be able to live up to that. You take any one of these people, and I've written biographies of Washington. Who have I written about? Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and about Madison and Hamilton and other things. None of them will be able to survive scrutiny if what you bring is a demigod divine set of expectations. That said, and here I'll be really quick, because I want to get to, and I'm going to then try to ask Richard a question, and then he'll ask me one, and then we can throw it to you guys. Why are these guys so great? Why do you spend all this time in your life reading about these guys, Professor Ellis? I give you the Willie Sutton answer. You are a crowd that is able, able of, to remember who Willie Sutton was. Most of my students, of course, have no vaguest idea who he is. He was a prominent bank robber from the 50s who kept getting caught. And when they caught him, they would always ask Willie, Willie, you know, you keep getting caught. Why do you rob banks? And Willie said, because that's where they keep the money. <laughs> the 18th century is where they keep the money rather the ideas, rather the values and institutions that we continue to live under, where the Big Bang happens, from which the values of the liberal state radiate out into the 21st century, the oldest enduring republic in world history. So what did they do? Four things. They won the first successful war for colonial independence. Nobody else had ever done that before. British Army and Navy together is the most powerful thing on the planet at the time. The Army by itself not, but the Army and the Navy, yes. Ask yourself this question. How many wars did Great Britain lose between 1750 and 1950? They created the first nation-sized republic. It was assumed by Montesquieu, the great philosopher of the subject, that republics could only work in small areas, Swiss cantons, Greek city-states. The American United States experience argued, attempted to impose the same republican form of government on a large population over a large landmass, which it was assumed would never work. It was too weak a form of government to control and manage a population. Over two centuries later, we're still here. They were the first major power, major nation, to separate church and state. 
it was assumed that a nation required a common religious experience to, as a form of glue to hold the people together. If you remove that, what you'd get is total chaos. While many of the states retain some form, usually of a Protestant establishment up for the first 20 to 25 years of the 19th century, at the national level, the United States is committed to a fundamental separation of church and state. And you will read some evangelical folks who like to reinterpret this, but guess what? They don't know shit. Okay? Finally, they undermined the assumption that there had to be a single source of sovereignty in every body politic. This was a principle that had its roots in Aristotle, but Blackstone reestablished it for England in the 19th century. In fact, if England had been able to give this up, they wouldn't have had the American Revolution. Because as you remember, the British basically said, look, we can't have 13 separate colonies deciding what's right about taxation, okay? If they'd been able to simply allow us to do that, the British Commonwealth would have been discovered 100 years too earlier. But the notion you can have separate sovereignty, and it's ambiguous, church, excuse me, state, federal sovereignty, and layers of it that makes the ambiguity of the sovereignty question uh, important. And so we'll say, well, it's not ambiguous. The sovereign source of the American Republic is the people. Ha, ha, ha. Try to figure out what that means. Um, so that these are major achievements that have influenced the shape of modern political thought. And we are now the model for the liberal nation state in the world. They created it. Two huge failures. And any attempt to discuss their legacy without these failures is not just incomplete, but wrong. We failed to achieve a just settlement of the Native American question. And we failed to resolve the question of slavery in a way that was just, without war. There, any history that doesn't address those is not accurate. The question, though, that I hope we may be able to discuss, we can say these are failures, and they were. And we can say they were tragedies, and they were, and they are. Are they Greek tragedies or Shakespearean tragedies? Ah. A Greek tragedy is built in, intractable. Sic volvere parcas, tis the will of the gods. Agency won't work. You can't change it. Shakespearean tragedy with human decisions moving differently could have turned out differently. If we get into it in the discussion, I will argue that the Native American question is a Greek tragedy and the slavery question is a Shakespearean tragedy. And I'll try to tell you how we could have solved it and why Jefferson's stock is going down. Um, uh, that's my thing. I got to ask him a question now. We, I, we tried to figure out what kind of argument we could have, okay? And he's, he's, a, he's a conservative, okay? Well, I'm actually- Well, our parties are both F, right? Federalist? Yes, we are. That's, well, see, this is why I can't argue with him. I mean, I mean I, we had tried to make up arguments over dinner. Um, um, Let me take that as the question then. As a person who's spent a sub substantial portion of your working time looking back at the late 18th century, the people you like, the people you write about, are almost all Federalists. Adams, Hamilton, Washington, Governor Morris, now John Marshall, right? They're all Federalists. 
These are all people that believe that there is a collective American interest that's represented by the federal government, which is the center of my liberal perspective now in the 21st century. And the antithesis of the conservative agenda represented by the National Review that you work for. So are you bimodal? <laughs> well, Do you, you live in one place in the 18th century and then change clothes when you go to work for the National Review? Well, the federal, uh, they're all dead, as That's you said. That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, they no, are, yeah. No, but look, uh, 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 one part of the answer is you know there are also a lot of Federalist bad apples. Yeah. And, and uh, defeat didn't improve their character. And, and, you know, by the end of the Federalist Party, uh, it ought to have died. It, it earned its own death. Yeah, but you it and I agree, without them, the Republic might not have That's survived. That's right. That's right. But, but, but look, you, you wrote a book on, you wrote a whole book on Jefferson, which was critical, but not, not a demolition job either. Right. And, and I've also written about Jefferson because he keeps coming into the lives of whoever I'm writing about. And, uh, and we can spend the whole rest of the evening going through his, his shortcomings, his errors, his, you know, his this, that, and the other. But he also did grasp uh, something, and, and maybe more than any of these, these other men, uh, he had a faith, and it was sometimes self-deceiving. Uh, sometimes it seems like all rhetoric. But it, I think it was uh, a deep part of him. He would never want to have given it up. He would have felt ashamed of himself if he could have believed that he was somehow being what is it? What is it? Tell it. me, tell me. The faith is that the people know best. The people know best. If you give a moral problem to a, a professor and a peasant, the peasant will answer it as well as the professor. And now who, that, now, who is more like a professor than Thomas Jefferson and less like a peasant? And yet, Jefferson really did believe that. And that's part of the explanation of his political success, why he was um, electorally successful in a way that his Federalist rivals were not. Um, they were conflicted. I mean, Hamilton, you know, the last letter of his life, he says, our disease is democracy. And yet he also spends his whole adult life writing in newspapers, trying to persuade the readers of newspapers right. of his ideas. So he, he's got a split in his head. Um, you know, Jefferson doesn't have that split. And so there is, you know, uh, yes, Jefferson. I'm a Federalist, but, 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 you know, thank God we also had mm -hmm. him and that he is also there in the mix. I don't, I can't disagree with the last thing. I wrote this book called Founding Brothers, which... Um, thank God to which, because I have three boys, all of whom their college education was partly paid by <laughs> the royalties on founding brothers. And um, one of the arguments I made in there is that if you want to explain why there is this gush of leadership that succeeds in the late 18th century is the diversity of leadership within the revolutionary generation. Namely, we're familiar with the principle of checks and balances inside the Constitution. There is within the generation temperamental, ideological diversity. There's, you, a, there's diversity in Jefferson's own head. There is Jeff, that's true. I mean, he's, and they don't talk to each other. I mean, he, do, you know, he, Jefferson's incapable of hypocrisy because he doesn't allow, you know, there's a Trumpian dimension to Jefferson here. And, um, he doesn't allow his mind to understand what he's just done. Um, uh, and he will, for example, exchange letters. You and I have both written about this with Washington. You know, he's just got through libeling Washington publicly and, or behind the scenes, and he doesn't, and he then writes to Washington and like he hasn't, he doesn't seem to remember that he's done that, okay? or he's libeled Adams and then he c corresponds with Adams. He's hired James Thompson Callender to libel Adams in this, in this uh, election. And then he writes to Abigail and says, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's telling the truth. He doesn't know. Um, which is part of my, pro but 
what about, I started here, if you let Jefferson go by himself, you get anarchy. If you let Hamilton go by himself. Well, you, you, you get demagogy. I mean, that, that would be, that would well, be the worst a, of well, Jefferson. A revolution every generation, to change the Constitution every, every 20 years. Yes, but who leads it? Well, I mean, but my point he is... He does, behind he doesn't, the scenes. He, he has no sense of any need for enduring contra contracts. And if you believe that sovereignty resides in the individual, that these natural rights are individual rights, and that the interest of the collective is always an alien force, that's a recipe for anarchy. Well, yes, but, uh, wait a second, but if, if you don't believe that there are rights residing in the individuals, then you don't have the American Revolution. Well, you can the, believe we the individuals have, been... have rights, but they have rights within. In Adams' sense, they have. I, Adams is big on saying Massachusetts is not a state; it's a what? Commonwealth. Commonwealth. And Virginia copies that. Pennsylvania copies that, and Kentucky copies that. Um, and that it's a New England point of view that the collective is the way in which your individual identity expresses itself. Okay, and Jefferson doesn't have that, um, and the Jeffersonian position is an enlightenment um, utopian position. If you let people pursue their self-interest freely in the marketplace, everybody will be happy and the goods and services will be distributed equally. Guess what? It doesn't work that way. Um, and guess what? The whole history of the 20th century is a repudiation of the values that Jefferson believed in. That's not to mention the fact that Jefferson, among the founders, is the only one who believes that blacks are biologically, biologically inferior and can never become equal. Everybody else thinks it's a function of environment, that it's because they you know, were raised in Africa. They're all pre-Mendel, by the way. They're not just pre-Darwin, they're pre-Mendel. And therefore, they think, in the 18th century, if we move these Africans over here, over a couple generations, they'll turn white. That's what they think. They do. Um, and then they'll be, it'll be okay. Jefferson believes that blacks are inherently inferior and can never become the equal of whites. And therefore, and this is a real killer, if we free them, we can only free them once we know where we're going to send them. Expatriation. Expatriation back to Africa or somewhere in the Caribbean. If we don't have a plan to, to send them away, we can't free them. Because if we let them, if we emancipate and we leave them here, they will intermarry and pollute the Anglo-Saxon race. This is a guy that's fathering six children by Sally Hemings when he's writing this, okay? Who's, who, whose argument about why he can't oppose slavery depends upon a racial argument about sexual interaction that he is himself engaging in for 38 years. Like, now look, I'm from Virginia. I have the same color hair that Thomas Jefferson has. I went to the same college that Thomas Jefferson went to, William and Mary, okay? He is the biggest hypocrite in American history. When he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, he doesn't mean what you think he means. Well, but he never believed, he never believed that slavery was a good. No, he didn't. He never believed that. Uh, that was the discovery of a later generation of American statesmen. That's right, Calhoun. And, and that's Calhoun most famously. No, not a single member of the revolutionary generation ever made that argument. All of them, including the southern slave owners, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, all said slavery was a violation of the principles on which the revolution is founded. They all said that. It's a cancer. Even though they were slaveholders? Yes. They all said that. They well, and, and they would, you know, a, a common maneuver was to blame it on England. Yeah, you know, Jefferson the, the, did that. The yeah. laws of the British Empire were such 
that the slave trade was encouraged, it was allowed, um, you know, poor us, it's not our fault, this was foisted on us. You, you can see that there's a lot of self-pity and blame shifting going on in this, but at the same time, there, there is a, a recognition which they never, uh, which they did not abandon, that they were engaged in something that was wrong and that was contrary to their own principles, to the principles that they were upholding and maintaining, and to some degree practicing. I mean, the last um, American commander in chief to command mixed race units was George Washington in the, in the Revolution up to the Korean War. Up to War. the Korean War, right. You know, it's not until the Korean War that we have integrated units in, in the U.S. Washington Army. didn't want it, it was sort of forced on He didn't him. want it at first, yeah. but as, as people who've looked at his records as commander-in-chief, how he deals with soldiers when they get in trouble. Yeah. You know, a soldier goes off the base, he gets, drunk, he gets in some sort of trouble with the local authorities, and there's lots of cases of this crossing his desk, and some of these soldiers are black, you know, from, from units that had black soldiers. And he treats them all in the same way. So after his initial, you know, kind of shock at, at coming up to Boston and seeing that Massachusetts units have, have, you know, some black and Indian soldiers in them, he gets over that and he treats his own soldiers the same, the same way. So uh, there was that. There was also the fact that uh, in July 4th, 1776, every state that signed the Declaration of Independence permitted slavery. The only state that didn't was Vermont and it was not yet a state. So all the original 13 states, they all had slavery, but by the end of the founding generation, the states north of Maryland had all either ended it or begun the process of ending Last, it. They uh, put you it can, in You motion. can predict with absolute accuracy the which one states will go first, second, third, fourth in the north and ending slavery contingent on the sizes of the black population in the state. That's right. Words, New York is more, one of the last ones because it has a lot that's of, right. of black the more, people in the it. The more blacks in the state, the longer it takes. And because, and this is a killer, this is going to, you're not going to like this. Among all of the imaginative contributions the founders made, end of uh, separation of church and state, large republic, multiple sovereignties. They could not imagine a biracial society. And nobody else could either. Harriet Beecher Stowe's appendix in Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852 is uh, an appendix about where we're going to send them after they're free. Abraham Lincoln in 1863, um, before it's clear what's going to happen at the end of the war, um, has a six-man uh, presidential commission sent to Panama to explore the prospects of Panama as a location for the emancipated blacks. All the abolitionists, with maybe one or two exceptions, in the 19th century were abolitionists who said, as soon as we free them, we've got to get rid of them and send them somewhere else. Well, now let me, wait a second, let me, let me add some caveats to that. Uh, Hamilton grew up in a biracial society. Um, it, it was a society that had horrific plantation slavery, but it also had a free black population. I'm talking about St. Croix. Right. Um, Washington, now he dies before the American colonization movement gets going, uh, which is the Liberia you right. know, project, send, send it, free them, send them to Liberia. But uh, in his provisions in his will, where he, he frees... He stay in Virginia. Where he, 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 Which is a violation of Virginia law. Was it a violation of law at the time or shortly thereafter? It was at the time, and, and, and they... And, but nobody's going to, you know, if, if Washington wants to do whatever he wants to do, they're not going to challenge that. But that at the time that he wrote his will, that it was illegal for a black to remain in Virginia after free freedom for one, after a year. Right, so he, he seems at least accepting of the fact that they will stay where they are. Yeah. And in fact, there are, you know, to this day, there are in Alexandria descendants of his freed slaves. I was born and raised in Alexandria. Well, so, so you know I mean, this. Yeah, but, but that's not, 
doesn't address the core of my point. The core of my point is the belief that the United States is capable of being a biracial society is a mid 20th century idea that was not accepted by the bulk of the population and by the leadership of the population at the time of the founding. And this includes most of the people on the abolitionist side of the question. Now, Washington, that's not the same thing as slavery, okay? Slavery, wrong, yes, got to get rid of it, that's bad. And Washington ended slavery among the slaves he owned at Mount Vernon, as some people in the room know better than we do, in large part because he knew he'd be sitting at Williams College 240 years later talking about it, and he wanted to get right on that issue. So that one of the things operating for these, these people is- Fame. That, huh? Fame. Fame. That one of the, is that for a lot of people in the late 18th century, the idea that you're gonna live on forever in, the, in heaven is no longer so clear. And the only form of immortality that really can be counted on is a form of secular, secular, not sexual, but secular immortality. And that means in the history books, that means in the minds of future generations. And in some sense, they're on their best behavior. Um, I mean, and Washington is clearly in this category um, uh, because they know we're gonna be watching. In some sense, we're complicitous in their own, their excellent performance. Um, but on this one issue that it, it's really, it's really, I'll, let me make a very brief make the case. If you wanted to end slavery, there was a way to do it. If you wanted to avoid the Native American tragedy, I don't think there was a way to do it short of about five million frontal lobotomies on all the white Americans that are moving across the Alleghenies. Because if you take a look, here's some numbers. In 1780, there are 120,000 Native Americans between the Mississippi and the Alleghenies and 3,000 whites. In 1790, there are 80,000, there are 50,000 whites. In 1800, there are 50,000, there are 450,000 whites. Okay, they're all bringing their diseases with them. They're overwhelming the Native American population. I don't see an answer to that. Washington actually tried to come up with an answer, created the homelands policy east of the Mississippi. Most historians have written about Washington, with this exception over here and this one here, have, have tended not to notice that the most important thing he did in his first term was to try to find a, a, a way of creating these homelands that would avoid the, the, uh, the removal thing, but he couldn't do it. it I mean, he, it was unenforceable. If you want to end slavery, the guy who had the power to do it and the historical moment to do it was Jefferson. Because with the Louisiana Purchase, you had a place to put them and you had a source of revenue to compensate the owners of the uh, slaves in the Deep South. So all you had to do was three things, all of which Jefferson on the record has said he wanted to do. Abolish slavery in the territories. He is on record in the Northwest Territory in 1784 saying that. All, throughout all the territories. Um, then use a portion of the revenue to compensate those people in the Deep South, those states you know, east of the Mississippi, for freeing their slaves. The, rev the, the Louisiana Purchase caught $15 million, and in modern terms, it's hard to know what that really means, but it's you know, a couple hundred million. Um, the revenue from that, in modern terms, is $7 billion. There's a lot of money that we make on that. All you gotta do is put aside a portion of that and pay, pay for the, but the problem is, for Jefferson, when he thinks about this, he said to Matt, he writes to Monroe, he said, with regard to the West, this is the American future and it must exist without blot. By blot, he means blacks. Native Americans are okay. We can assimilate them. African-Americans can never be assimilated. Um, 
and we can't put them out there. Um, if there would, that was the chance to do it. Once you get past 1820, it's a, it's a Greek tragedy, I think. Well, I, because he didn't want to have a mixed race population. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I took too long. Well, no, I, I just wanna add one more wrinkle to this, which was that, um, and this is brought up in the Dred Scott decision by one of the dissenting justices. Um, in 1857, this, the majority opinion of the Supreme Court is that Dred Scott has no rights uh, because at the time that the Constitution was, was founded, he belonged to a race which no one considered was entitled to rights. This is Justice Taney's, Chief Justice Taney's opinion. But one of the dissenting justices pointed out that uh, at the time the Constitution was ratified, free blacks voted in five states. Uh, three of those states also had slavery. So you had the anomaly of states that had enslaved blacks but also free blacks who were able to vote. And Lincoln, the Cooper, you know, the, what's the name of that address? The Cooper? Cooper Union. Cooper Union address has done some, did research on this. You've written about this. Right. In which he tried to show that the Dred Scott decision was, was historically wrong. That, that, the, that a significant number of founders were opposed to the expansion of slavery in, any, in, in the West altogether. And they were on record as believing that slavery is incompatible with the values of the American Revolution. And, and he actually did research. I mean, Lincoln went back and did this research, you know, to try to find out what they were thinking about. Um, I mean, I think that, that the Dred Scott decision is probably the worst Supreme Court decision in American history. And um, we will disagree on that. The only competitor is Citizens United. And um, um, Roe v. Wade. <laughs> there, there we go. We, we see that. We see where we, we, we. But we can agree on Dred Scott. We can agree. We can agree, agree on, on Dred, Dred Scott. Scott. And, Should um, we throw this open to the audience here? We've been. Yes, we've so we been. Can. Um, or we can just keep chatting among we, ourselves. We uh, we uh, would like you to ask us some questions, because we are used to holding forth in ways that um, need to be interrupted. And now, in the 18th century, people went for hours, right? Hamilton spoke, he gave one six-hour speech at the Constitutional well, Convention. Lincoln, too. Lincoln-Douglas debates, you know. Right, yes. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were uh, the opening speaker spoke for an hour, the reply was 90 minutes, and then the, the rebuttal, the first guy got another half hour. So, you know, plug this into the next presidential debate that you, uh, that you hear. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're the only one that's got a hand up there. Um, okay, guys, bring it back to Trump. Make the analogy to Trump. Because the title was The Founding Brothers, Charles and Penny Founding, and In the Age of Trump. Well, you, you might have noticed no, that. You, you might have noticed that in my discussion of, of Washington's qualities. Right, okay. Uh, and there are others. Um, uh, Washington uh, fought in the French and Indian War and in the Revolutionary War, and he was prepared to fight again when it looked like we'd go to war with France when he's in his late 60s. Uh, and he never had bone spurs in any of those wars. So um, that's a point to consider. Uh, Joe? Uh, which, which means that, you know, he and I will agree on the fact that President Trump is, is an embarrassment and an accident and an aberration and the most, um, hist most inexperienced person ever to. Well, uh, let's, and let's fasten on that point because, okay. because I think the, the, the inexperienced question, um, he's, he's the first president we've had who's never held elective office nor been a general. So that's the profile of all the rest of them, and the profile of all the major party nominees, except for Wendell Wilkie. And uh, I brought up Horace Greeley, who was like a congressman for two months or something. But, the, mm -hmm. but those were the only, the only anomalies up till now. Uh, and, and Ross Perot, if you consider Ross Perot a mm -hmm. major third party major uh, a candidate. But so, so the founders did think, um, and even though Jefferson had this, this populist streak, 
uh, they had an elitist notion of politics. They wanted, they wanted politics to be conducted by people who knew what they were doing, who had a feeling for it. Um, this, is, this is one of the reactions that uh, Governor Morris, who's the draftsman of the American Constitution, and through a fortuitous um, circumstance, he's in, he moves to Paris in February of 1789, and then he stays for four years. He starts off as a businessman, and then he becomes our, he's named our ambassador. So he sees the whole beginning of the French Revolution. And, and his, he never thinks it's going to work. And, and one of his earliest remarks is they want to have an American government. They want to have an American-like constitution, but they don't reflect that they don't have Americans to run such a thing. And he's not, you know, he's not like making some sort of ethnic or racial point about Frenchmen. He's saying they have no experience of self-government. They just don't. And even under colonialism, under the British Empire, we did because all these colonial legislatures had one elective house. You know, and in his own family, he had, he had uncles and grandfathers who'd had colonial offices. So he sort of felt when it, he became an adult and he got into politics, he knew what it was all about, so did all his peers. So, and, and there's a point there that, yeah. uh, I, I mean, the way, she, the way- What she, she's asking us, Richard, is that we've, st we've spent all the time talking about the 18th century and that's because that's what we know about. And I have opinions on Trump that are not totally the opposite of his, so there will be a point. Um, but I think that if you take anybody from the late 18th century and bring him into a late 20th or early 21st sense American, century American political culture, they will believe, Trump is only the last stage of it. None of the first five presidents would ever run for political office in this context. They would regard it as an act of prostitution. They would simply refuse to participate. Um, well, I'm going to disagree with you there. Uh, Madison certainly, he invents modern politics. He invents modern po partisan politics. He gets that in a way that his peers do not. He's ahead of the curve. He's one of the creators of the oldest political party in the world. He called it the Republican Party. It became the Democratic Party under Jackson. And he and Jefferson set that up. Jefferson was the ideologist of it, the poet of it. Madison, it's funny you should pick Madison. This guy's 5'4", 120 pounds, can't be heard, would be total failure on television. Uh, I mean, he's he would never make it. He's yeah. great in back rooms, though. Yeah, but he's, that's, my point is, I mean, like, if you brought John Adams into the president and took him to a mall, he would have a heart attack. We're talking about a different world, Richard, okay? We're talking about a different society that speaks a different language with a different set of values and accents um, that is lost. And it's one, gone. It's never coming back. Mark Twain said it when he went to the Holy Land. Christ's been here once, will never come again. Okay? It's, it's back there. Now, you can learn from it, but you're going to have to make translations. You're going to have to be able to make adjustments. And so any direct comparison between then and now is, is automatically wrong. Well, here's a direct comparison. If they did come back, I'm sure they would all say, you know, they, listening to our political debates, they would say, congratulations, you've cleaned it up. It's less crazy, it's less vicious, it's less dishonest. Now, we're getting back to those levels, but if you really want to read foaming at the mouth craziness, you have to go back to the 1790s, 1790s. right He's up right. to the War He's of 1812, right. and it's not just Alex Jones equivalents. Uh, it's, you know, it's not just ratty journalists doing it, although they certainly are doing it. It's the great men we're talking about. I mean, Thomas Jefferson really believes that Alexander Hamilton is a British agent and a monarchist. He really believes that. And Hamilton seems to really believe that Jefferson may set up guillotines if he becomes president. 
or at least there's there's I a I think Hamilton's more likely to be right than Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> and Hamilton might have had a little tongue in cheek when he wrote that, yeah. but he he did write that. And and here is the greatest difference. When Vice President Cheney shot that guy, it was an accident and he lived. When Vice President Burr shot Hamilton, it was not an accident and he died. And that was not the only duel that they had. There was another signer of the Constitution killed in a political duel. A signer of the Declaration was killed in a duel. Jefferson put a duelist on the Supreme Court. Brockholz Livingston, he'd killed a man in a duel. It was never brought up, no confirmation <laughs> hearing about this. He just got on the court. Um, they killed each other. They killed each other, and we don't do that anymore. Well, yeah, no, I mean, but. Well, yes, that's important. But, it's, it, but there was Burr that killed Hamilton, but there wasn't the. It wasn't it, it judicially wasn't, it done. Wasn't it wasn't the like revolution. no, no, it, it was not. The, it was there not. There was no guillotine. No, there was there no wasn't. firing squad wall. That's the difference between. No, the that's Americans. right. You that's agree right. With that, right. Of course, I agree with that. But but the tone. Uh, I'm just saying that that not only do I think that they didn't invent modern political parties in the sense that we have them now, and I think Madison was a pioneer in that, but in some ways we shouldn't like wring our hands and say, oh, we're terrible, we're worse, we've fallen off, because um, the way they conducted it was, was, was right more foaming at the it, mouth than it, we did. It is true that the 19, the, excuse me, the 18, excuse me, the 1790s is really crazy in terms of the level of partisanship. And part of that is it's new. Yeah. They don't know, they don't understand the way we understand that if you lose, you've got another shot in two years, four years, eight years. And we all kind of know that in our bones now because it's been going on for 200 years. When it's brand new, it's only in the Constitution. That's the only place it is. And so you think, you know, the, the Federalists think, Jesus, if we lose, these crazy Jeffersonians are going to destroy the place. And, and, and the Republicans are thinking, if these Federalists stay in, they're going to turn it into a monarchy, and it will be over. Everything will be done. And, and that's the only, you can only unlearn that by that's time. Good. And remember, the reason that that level of hysteria existed is because there had never been a republic like this before in world history, okay? They're doing something. Every other one washes up on the banks of history within the first decade. And this doesn't happen here. So that their concerns, while you know, hysterical on occasion, that's because it looks easy now, because we now are living after we see the outcome. They don't know what the outcome's going to be. And they're living on the edge of, of a catastrophe and improvising accordingly. There was a woman who had a hand up right here. Yes, ma'am. So you, each of you described leadership in very different ways. Um, Ms. Brookhiser, you talked about personal attributes. And uh, as Sarah was, you talked about it in terms of accomplishments. Yeah. So achievements, yeah. Achievements. How would you apply, each apply your standards to what's going on contemporary? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, let, let me say, I, I've lived in New York City since 1977, so I've seen all Donald Trump's whole public career. And, and it's, you know, it's like, my God, I mean, who else from page six are we going to elect next? I mean, Alec Baldwin or Kim Kardashian or, you know, or, or I like Paris Hilton. I like Baldwin. That would be good. Baldwin would be uh, good. No, yes. no, it wouldn't be good. Um, <laughs> You know, so there's that kind of, there, there's an element of jaw drop in it, even so. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I do have to chasten myself and recognize that one talent this guy had was getting elected. You know, and everybody said, I said, all my journalistic colleagues said, well, his ceiling's 20%. Yeah, his ceiling's 20%. And then we said, oh, his ceiling's 30%. <laughs> and then we said, oh, his ceiling's 40%. And then it was 46% plus all the states that he needed to win to win. So we were wrong. No, uh, but it's a component. It is a component. Maybe it's the first story of the building somehow. Yeah, I think that, it, like, um, 
If you're looking for leadership in American society in the early 21st century, the last place you look for it is in the federal government. It's not there in either party. It exists in place in local places. We can find local people that we know are leaders. It might exist in certain forms in, in, uh, in the West, you know, in, out there in, you know, places like, you know, the West Coast with all of the technology stuff. But um, we're a oligarchic plutocracy. And um, every person coming into Congress is told you spend 50% of your time raising money. Um, and we're not embarrassed about it. We don't, we don't think that's really a bad thing. Um, so if I was to advise anybody now, I'd say start at the local level. That's where the American Revolution started, really. Taverns. Yeah, and um, that, that leadership doesn't exist in the, in the federal government now. In fact, if you are a person who has those instincts, it's suicidal. It's absolutely fatal for your prospects. Um, and the, the attitudes towards the federal government have in some sense been orchestrated by the conservative movement, um, heavy influence of money, dark money. But it changed for other reasons too. It changed between the early 60s and the middle 70s. It was the, the left abandoned the idea of the, the question, do you trust the federal government? 1960, 80% yes. 1976, 80% no. Well, we'd had two wars, Vietnam and on poverty. And uh, well, neither seemed to work. Well, you we also had the civil rights movement that, uh, that meant that whites in the South abandoned the federal government. And we also had uh, Watergate which meant that a lot of people just lost faith in, in the whole thing. So that you had the left leaving for Vietnam, you had the right leaving because of the Civil Rights Movement, which your guy was opposed to, of course. And, um, um, and um, so that that's changed, so that, that it, the only way, I mean, if, if, if economic inequality is the dominant problem, the dominant economic problem in the United States, the only way you can change it is if you believe the federal government has the right to redistribute money. And people don't believe that. It's socialistic, right? And um, now if you go back to the founders, Adams believed it, Washington believed it, Franklin believed it, Hamilton believed it, Jefferson did not believe it. Um, so the, I'm, you know, in the, I'm in the process of writing a book called, what's it called, Then and Now, The Founders and Us, and trying to search for precedents that are relevant and not uh, back then. Though a lot of things aren't going to be relevant. Um, but the thing that most frustrates me is that, um, in some sense, the, the founding's been captured by the, by the right in the originalist Well, movement. the left has seeded it. That's true. The left too. doesn't care about it. That's the left true. has contempt for it. That's true. That's true. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, the person who replaced me at Mount Holyoke College uh, teaches only Native American stuff. If you said, you know, what was the Stamp Act, she wouldn't have the vaguest idea. She has a PhD from Yale University. We don't have American Studies at your We have American Studies, but, uh, but Actually, American studies, no, went out of existence, it did go out of existence, uh, because it became anti-American studies. Most people who teach in American studies are anti-American. Um, and, but that the social history replaced traditional forms of history over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, I'm a weird guy in the sense that I actually think mainstream politics is an important thing for students to understand. You, and like, you know, at, at really great places like Williams College, I would bet you that 20% of the people, I'm, I'm, you won't believe this, but some of the faculty can tell you, they don't know what came first, the American Revolution or the Civil War. Okay? It's now, all right. It's the Let's level, the level of illiteracy is American Revolution first, right? <laughs> Civil War first? American yeah. Revolution wins. 
Well, I mean, the level of historical illiteracy is unbelievable. And, and, but the left has abandoned the mainstream narrative in order to raise the, the profile of women, blacks, and Native Americans. I'm a little more hopeful than you, Joe. I think people want to know about this. They, they don't get it in school, but they still want to know oh, about I, it. Oh, I, I and, believe and that's that. Why, that's why, you know, hey, Hamilton is this hit on Broadway. That's why The Turn hey, is on Founding television. Hey, Founding sold five million copies. Um, you know, so I'm happy as dog squad about that. Um, <laughs> Oh, no. No. He knows nothing. He said the Hamilton show was overrated, <laughs> I hear. Sad. <laughs> the president's call congratulating the president of Turkey on um, solidifying his autocratic regime. Well, you know, this, the, uh, this relates also to his Russophilia, and I think, you know, a lot of... Uh, of, of anti, uh, you know, people who are engaged in opposing Trump are, are like looking for the kind of the, the dark secret, the payoff that will get him impeached. You know, the proof that Putin slipped like the five ruble note in his pocket, uh, <laughs> you know, in October and that, that changed the election. No, it, you're not going to find that. The worst thing is what's in public, is what he said in public repeatedly. You know, his admiration uh, what seems to be his admiration for Putin, his saying, well, we, we murder people too. I mean, this, this, you know, this constant sort of equation of, of Putin's Russia and the United States and saying there's no difference and it doesn't matter. And, the, and Erdogan is, you know, kind of a little Putin in, in this scheme and he just seems to um, like those uh, uh, people. There's he a kind of bromance factor there. The great uh, thing about Trump there. is that he doesn't know he's a monarchist. He doesn't know enough history to know what that is. He just feels an instinctive affection for people who are, have unlimited power and nobody can question, whether that's Putin or the guy in Turkey or Chinese guy. The Chinese guy's got the party to respond to. But that, I mean, all Well, and you know, and, and not in fairness to Trump, but in explanation of Trump, he, he, he has run a smallish family privately held business. He didn't have a you know, I mean, trustees not, to report to. Right. It's not, you know, it's not General Motors it's or beyond something that, like though. that. It's I mean, that, 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 true. It's true. Yes, and then it, there's it, temperament. It, it, there's well, temperament on top it, of it. He is emotionally and intellectually impaired. He is sick. He is a sick person. He is clinically screwed up. Okay? <laughs> I mean, we have elected a person who is an extreme psychiatric narcissist and um, who cannot tell the difference between truth and his own perception of reality. He cannot tell. He really can't. So that all you make these great arguments about what he's going to do in North Korea, it has nothing to do with events. It doesn't. It has to do with how it hits him in a particular moment. And... Um, I mean, I, 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 I well, yeah, we will have it, but I think that, that, no, yes, we should go to another, I'll shut up. Yes, sir. Uh, th thank you both for being here. This is, this is great. Uh, Mr. Brookhart, you, you mentioned about the, the founders of the Lena Street, and that just brings to me, I, that I made you think of the Electoral College, which is sort of relevant to the whole Trump thing, and so I'll, you know, I'll portray my biases, but from a, from sort of a founder's perspective, people have studied these people and how they were thinking, what is there to redeem the Electoral College in, in the modern uh, Is it totally outdated? Yes. Uh, no, no, what, is, what is there to say for the Electoral College? Well, what they would have said for the Electoral College, uh, they, were, they were trying to think of how, how do we pick the president. And the, I think the negative model they had was Poland, which had elected kings. And so Poland was, was surrounded by hostile neighbors, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And you know, even as they were deliberating, Poland was getting smaller and smaller because they were carving off slices of it. And the way they did this was interfering in these elections of their kings. The, the kings were elected by the nobility, every Polish nobleman. And the Polish nobility was a large, you know, it was, it was a rather large group of people. But so they were bought off. 
you know, these, these other countries would make it their interest to buy off certain Polish nobles, and that's how they'd try and get their guy in the kingship. So they didn't want Congress to pick the president because that might be susceptible to bribery, right? Because Congress is an ex a pre-existing thing. You know who's in Congress, therefore you know who you can pay off. So you wanted like a one-time group to make this choice, and then it would go away. And then the next election, you know, another set of electors would, would be chosen. So that's, that's part of the reason that, I think that's the main reason we have this odd, this very odd body. Mm, no, 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 no. Well, the, and the, it also reflects the power of the states. That's that there's a compromise reached in July that creates a bicameral legislature in which the states control one branch and the population as a whole controls the other. That's the central co uh, compromise in the convention because the issue is at stake is are we going to be a confederation or a nation? okay, we're still going to recognize the states, but we're going to also have some sort of national existence. The Electoral College represents a decision made in late August to try to replicate that same pattern for the election of the presidency. Okay, the states will have power, have, have an unusual power. That they knew, they talk about this, that this was a gerrymandered thing. That they don't believe in it. They don't have much commitment to it. It's a compromise. Most people wish it would have gone more one way or the other. There's Wilson in Pennsylvania and thinks, and Morris too, thinks we should go to a popular election. But we don't know how to do it because of the logistics of that in the late 18th century. The one thing that I'm sure of, if you could ever bring them back, which in case you can't do, they would be absolutely astounded that we still have the Electoral College. This is like a complete archaic contraption. The rest of the world doesn't understand it. Most Americans don't understand it, okay? And yet we're stuck with it because you can never get rid of it without a constitutional amendment. I mean, well, that might be wrong because there are individual well, yes. states moving to this notion that we're gonna require a majority, you know, they're gonna side with the majority. So there might be a way to beat this. Um, I would be, given the fact that in the 21st century, as early as we, are, we already had two elections in which the person who won a majority of the votes lost the electoral vote, we're, that's, that's a troubling sign, it seems to um, me. But be careful, because if it goes to a popular vote, and I'll, I'll lay down this marker, you will have fraud that you will not believe, because that will mean that any vote stolen anywhere is worth the stealing. You know, now you have to have your political machine, only your political machines energized in key states count. If we get rid of the Electoral College and go to a straight popular vote, I will predict unbelievable levels of fraud. I don't see any elections. reason why the fraud would be any greater with that arrangement than it is now. And I think that people on the right have over uh, emphasize the existence of voter fraud in a way that's fraudulent, as a matter of fact. There isn't much fraud, there isn't much voter fraud in the United States. I mean, and Trump believes that he actually won California, for God's sakes. I mean, um, so, I, I mean, we can argue about that. One of my old friends from college just died. Uh, he had, uh, he grew up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, he was a justice of the peace, briefly. He had, you know, some sort of local um, clout. Uh, and he knew there was a building that had been torn down, had 80 residents in it. It was torn down, and it still voted. They still voted election after election. And he never turned in the guy who ran that building because that guy was giving his mother an apartment. Okay? N of one, multiply that by... 500,000? That's like Ronald Reagan's argument about welfare women. I mean, you know, we could all find examples of that, but I well, think... Well, uh, yeah, yeah, without any effort at all, I found one. Well, So I, give, I, get, you know, put I, some I, effort. I, well, Joe, wake up. Look at the country you're living in, you know? 
L look at look at uh, look at Richard, hu look Richard, at humans' Richard. desires. Look, you're getting the whole presidency for God's sake. If you can do that just by making up a few a few thousand votes here and there, you think you're not going to do it, or you're not going to have someone, you know, not not Trump not the won candidates by 77, themselves. Trump seventy-seven thousand votes in three states. Okay, um, he's a he's a minority president. He doesn't have, he, if we are a democracy and we believe that the president should reflect the will of the majority, we do not have a person who so does. That, now, and now that's your true, argument, but the system, minute, no, wait now, a second, Russia, the system your said, that there is, your argument that Hillary there, Clinton knew the system going in and she never went to nobody's Wisconsin. Nobody's arguing about Hillary Clinton screwed up in major way. That's irrelevant to the point at stake. But the point I'm making is Since the Electoral College the is a sham. Him, the founders didn't believe it in at the time. Nobody else understands why we have it. And we're not going to be able to get rid of it because it will require a constitutional amendment in which all the small states will vote against any change because it's in their interest to do so. Um, and so that our argument is irrelevant. It's not going to change. But we're stuck in this situation. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. And again, if you'd be able to pull them from the grave, they would all say, oh, get rid of this damn thing. It's crazy. It's not. So any, if, if anybody tries to say the founders really thought the Electoral College was one of their major contributions to constitutional thought, they haven't the vaguest idea what the hell they're talking about. But it is within the spirit of the Constitution, in the sense that they tried to construct the government um, founded, in effect, on the will of the people, but at the same time did everything to make it hard to do that that could reasonably be done. And the Electoral College is, is, is I think. Well, if Hamilton had his way, the electors wouldn't be held, held to the view of the vote in their respective states. And that's the elitist point of view that you're referring to. So that if they wanted to vote for Bill Cl for Hillary Clinton instead of Trump, no matter what they voted in Kansas, they could do that. But that's not been a principle that has gained any level of acceptance in the United States in the 20th century. I mean, that, nobody is talking about doing that. Uh, I have a question. Or this is the last question. What did it say? in the two contexts that you referred to. The mind of the time, the mind and uh, culture of the founders on the one hand, and today on the other. That George Washington freed his slaves and violated the laws of Virginia by saying nobody could tell them whether they had to stay in Virginia or leave. Uh, what does that say? He's the only founder to do it. What does it mean? He's the founding his father. Pardon? He's the founding his father. <laughs> and he knew we were watching. He knew that Bob Dalzell would be sitting in that chair in uh, these years and would say, that's what makes him great. Because I've written a book with my wife about him, and I think that that's a worth, worthwhile thing to say. And you'd be right. But he knew that what he was doing. I mean, and I think you know that he knew, and we've all written about, they've got three people that have written books about Washington sitting here, and um, that uh, Washington was very aware of the fact, I mean, that, I mean, he didn't end slavery, he doesn't end slavery in his lifetime, he ends it on his wife's death, right? And the only reason she frees him early is because the slaves are threatening to poison her, right? Um, she fears that. And she fears, she fears that. that. Yeah, she fears that, right? Well, no. Right, and then she was, but she, anyway, see, it gets complicated, doesn't it? It's not so morally clear, um, but that in the, the, but he's the only one of the Virginia founders the, who frees his slaves. Madison doesn't uh, do it. Manette, George, George Wythe. Who? George Wythe. George Wythe. He's later, okay. I mean, I wouldn't put him in that category. Well, he, he taught Jefferson. Oh, you mean the Martha Whistle School of Law right. guy. Okay, okay, yeah. But he's got like five slaves, you know, and um, well, he married one. He freed people. all the ones he had. I mean, he, he married one, you know, like, but all right, among the prominent founders, nobody other than Washington freed his slaves. Nobody. And part of it is 
Nobody said um, this. Franklin he, had earlier. He freed, yeah, that's true. He, uh, and, well, he, um, I mean, years earlier. Yeah, much earlier. But that in some sense, the Virginians can't free them because they don't own them anymore. Their, their creditors own them. They're all bankrupt. Washington, I mean, Washington's not bankrupt because he owns the land in the West. But that uh, Jefferson's like the modern equivalent of $10 million in debt. And he's got Scottish creditors who, now, he could still free him because by the time the word gets over there to London, nobody will know. But that legally, economically, he doesn't own them anymore. And that's true of Madison. That's true of Patrick Henry. Um, that's true of Jefferson. They don't really own them. The creditors own them. Do you think they would have freed them if they did? No. 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 Thank you for coming.